Good evening and welcome to another edition of NNPA and Black Press USA. I'm your host, Taylor Thomas. We have some breaking news to report this evening. Former Empire star Jesse Smollett has been found guilty of five of six counts of disorderly conduct for false reporting a hate crime case back in 2019 in Chicago. Now that six men and six women took nine hours over yesterday and today to make that decision. Now he faces up to three years in prison when he's sentenced. Of course, we'll keep you up to date with that. But now to our show, I am really excited to bring this history maker to the light. You've already heard about her and you've seen about her, but now we get to do a one-on-one. -on -one. And if you don't know about Keisha Monk after tonight, you certainly will. She made history, as you may know, by being the first woman of color to announce live for the Tony Awards. In 2021, we're still saying the first. Ladies and gentlemen, The Voice, Keisha Monk. Yay! <laughs> Hi, hey, Taylor. Keisha. Hi, beautiful. How are you? Everything okay? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, uh oh, I'm having a little bit of issue. I don't think I can. I can hear you. Testing okay, one, now I can two. Testing, testing one, two. There we go. Can you hear? <laughs> I love this, Keisha. I love the setup. And so, full disclosure, everyone. I know Keisha. We started out together. Hey, Mark. Oh, Mark's already giving us some shout outs and love, some love. What's up, Mark? Mark Grant. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Christmas to you as Merry well. Merry Christmas, baby. <laughs> Keisha and I met in Raleigh, North Carolina. That's where the magic happened with me as far as meeting Keisha Monk at um, a radio station out there. So, so Keisha, I love the setup because you are the woman with the voice that just makes you stop. I remember that when I met you. Um, and I was really fresh in the business when I met you in Raleigh, North Carolina. So how did you get into the business of being a voiceover and then being the first, oh my goodness, um, the first woman of color to live announce at the Tonys? I'm still pinching myself over that girl. I, I totally am. Well, you know, I, to be honest, Taylor, I've always been fascinated with the science of my voice at a very, very young age. When I was a kid, true story, I used to, did you, did you ever have those 900 numbers where, where you uh, where you grow up? The 900, they're like party lines, you call them and they're like a dollar a minute. You don't, you, you don't remember. I, I, I do remember them. You I do? do remember them, yes. Well, I used to love doing that. I've gotten my butt beat so many times from one of my mother's <laughs> phone bill up because people always used to say, wow, you have a really, really nice voice. And so I used to get on these party lines. Again, as a kid, I was probably 10 <laughs> years old. This is corny, but it's the truth. I used to take like greeting cards and read them like, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. And people used to be like, oh my God, you have such a nice voice. And so, yeah, as a kid, I was just fascinated with, with voice, but never really wanted to, you know, I, I guess at that young age, never realized that I could actually make a career out of it. And so also being very musically inclined, I played six instruments. I went to the High School of Music and Art, the fame school in New York City. Oh, um, I didn't know that, Keisha. Loved, yeah, girl, I, I've always loved music. And so in college, I kind of wandered up to the radio station. I was a music major, but one day I just discovered that there was a radio station on, on campus and I was really, really fascinated. I'm like, dang, if I could talk and play music, that would be the ultimate career. And so that's truly where it started, um, you know, and uh, after I got fired from uh, the college radio station, I wandered over to QOK, which is where we met. And that's yes. really where it's all, that's where it all started for me. Oh my goodness. We had some fun back then, didn't we? We certainly did. <laughs> we certainly did. I was, um, I was determined. Do you know how I got that job? I don't know if I ever. No, you that. never told me, but I know I was excited when I first saw you and, and to see you <laughs> remembering that and see you where, where you are now. I just can't stop smiling. So how did oh. that happen? Well, I was told, and again, Hopefully some somehow, you know, during during the course of this interview, I will reiterate to people, to your listening audience, to your viewing audience, that you have got to kill the noise. 
People mm. told me, you're just a college kid. You don't have any experience. There's absolutely no way that you'll be able to get a job at a commercial radio station. You know what I'm saying? You got to get in the trenches and you, I'm like, well, how do I get experience if I don't get experience? And so with that mentality, I figured I'd get in how I could fit in. And the program director's name was Chris Connors. Oh my gosh, you went really far back. Yeah, I man. about Chris. Yeah, I, um, I had an interview with him. Uh, there's a young lady um, who used to work in the promotions department. What's her name? Pam. Pam Thompson. Pam told me, yeah, just, I, I met her at a remote, like at a McDonald's somewhere. And I was like, listen, I really, really want to work at the radio station. She introduced me to Chris. I got to Chris's office and his office was a mess. And so I asked him if I could just simply clean his office. You know, I, no. I didn't necessarily, yeah, I asked him if I could just be his assistant. That's how I got in the door. You got to be hungry for it. This business is no joke. It is cutthroat. You're great today and terrible tomorrow. And then get back up. And you've got to have some tough skin to you be do. in this industry. You, you got to get in where you dominate the one, right? Absolutely. Oh, gosh. That's a, that's a whole nother show, girl. Yes, it is. <laughs> that's a whole nother show. But I, I, I am the expert of slipping through the back door. You know what I mean? When folks aren't necessarily willing to open the front, they're sneaking through the back. And that's how I got in. That is where it all started for me. And so I ended up doing like um, overnights. Yes. I, was a sing I was a single mom at the time. I didn't have anybody to watch my baby. I used to sneak her into the radio station in her little carrier. And I used to put her up underneath the console. And I used to do overnights. And then from there, I ended up being the first female to ever do the quiet storm. Um, that's an accomplishment. Yes, that's yes. an accomplishment. Now that's it and, and at your age, let's not forget that, Keisha. Yeah, you weren't thirty young. and forty years old. I mean, that's yeah. a big deal. I mean, it so many is. of us got our feet fully entrenched in the business um, at the radio station in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is a great place to live and work. But yeah, um, they just let you spread your wings, which was always great because they really did. Yeah, they, they really did. Yeah, yeah and, and Scott Young took over. Remember that. Yes, I absolutely do. I absolutely. <laughs> what an exciting time. Um, and, and, you know, the Quiet Storm traditionally are hosted by men, you know, the That's men right. with the strong deep pipes, Quiet Storm. Um, and so with me being a woman doing it, it was kind of <laughs> scary. I used to get a lot of letters from, you know, the folks in the local jails. But at the same time, I what I finessed as a child, kind of talking sexy to people and stuff like that, I fell right into a, a, into a job where I played music and I talked to people. So what a blessing. What a blessing. I'm going to get emotional because I don't, don't. I'm sorry, I but when I, I think remember. about when I think about where I came from and how I had just this feeling of determination in spite of unfavorable circumstances, Keisha, God, that was a lot. God I mean, to be a single mother in this business, it is difficult um, to work overnight. Um, and at one point we were in the high rise where there was no security. And to be on the eighth floor as a woman leaving out the bathroom was out in the hall. Yes. And um, I, you just pushed through. It is, it is um, you know, when I got the, the word about you getting that honor of being the voice live for the Tonys this year and making history at doing it. I just said to myself, I have to have her on the show. Um, <laughs> I, I don't even know how it feels to be in a situation in 2021 to be a young African-American woman who can to this day say, I'm the first. Yeah. And the yeah. Tonys have been around for decades. 74 years to be exact. 74 years. And so I, I'm just, I'm really fortunate. And, and don't get it twisted. It's still hard. It is still extremely hard, extremely difficult. Um, but I just, I don't take no for an answer. So, I mean, that that's just, that's, that's just how I roll. I we just have to remember that. I know there's people out there that have been texting me. So if you see me looking down, I'm looking at my phone. Simply send in your questions. You want to give Keisha some love? Listen, we'll take your questions, your comments. We will read them live right here. Keisha will answer them or say hello, shout out, encouragement, whatever you want to do. Keisha, Absolutely. I want to take a second before we talk about the process of what you did for the Tony Awards 
uh, this year. Um, in this business, being a young mother and trying to get your feet wet um, and, and, and really get into this male dominated business, at least back then it was, I mean, it was more male dominated than it is now. Mm -hmm. Um, what is that challenge like being your only support? Cause you're not from Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. I'm a native New Yorker. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I again, I, you, I have this undescribable hunger to succeed. And when folks tell me no, it just makes me more persistent. I don't know. It, it, it's kind of hard to explain, but I embrace the no's because almost with all of the major gigs that I have gotten, they've told me no plenty of times. And that never fazed me. Never fazed me. You have got to be hungry. Now, I'm not saying that I haven't been discouraged and I haven't cried and I haven't pulled my hair out. Um, it, it has been extremely rough. Um, as a matter of fact, if you don't mind, Taylor, I, I, I'll give you the prime example and maybe you'll understand. The reason why I am in voiceover today is because I thought I was going to die. I had cancer at the time that I broke into the voiceover industry. Check this out. So I was at home, was sick off of the chemo. I did, the, the cancer just kept coming back. I did chemo, it kept coming back and I was totally weak. As a matter of fact, I had lost the activity of my limbs. I couldn't bear, I was walking with like a walker. What? And I was, at the, I was at the house, I was on the computer and I read about like this, this contest, this voiceover contest where this agency in Virginia was giving away a a voiceover contract worth a hundred thousand dollars. And so shoot, I figured I'd enter. What else am I doing? And so I recorded the script and I sent it in and I kept advancing to like the next round until I made the final top 10. Girl, when I got in the studio and they handed me the script to read, and again, this is American Idol style. So it's a room full of people <laughs> and everybody's in tuxedos and I'm standing there shivering because Yes, I was a radio personality, but voiceover is a completely different ball game. It's just it not is. reading copy. <laughs> You've got to be able to connect that copy with people who are listening. And so when they handed me that paper, Taylor, it was about cancer. Mm. Girl, please, I don't normally tear up. I just know. Listen, Ooh. listen, mm. the script was my life. Mm. It was about a woman named Sarah who was basically giving a testimonial about the great cancer service or the great cancer care at Duke University Hospital. Okay. And so that was my reality. And so as I'm reading the script, I'm really reading the script. It's really me. I'm literally in the studio with a walker with my body riddled with cancer. And the script was about cancer. And so I read the script and I didn't win the contest, but they gave me a contract anyway. And that was the beginning of my voiceover career. Keisha, when did you find out that you had cancer? Because you you are working, right? I wasn't working at that time. I was literally on disability. I had minimal money. I barely could afford my medication. In fact, I'll never forget when they told me I needed chemotherapy, they asked me for my W-2s. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it was rough. It was really, really rough. But um, I, couldn't, I couldn't work in radio anymore. But I felt, I didn't feel like dying. And so I want to say that really voiceover is responsible for allowing me to live. It gave me something to live for, gave me something else to, to conquer. And here I am today, just, just I love this story. In, in all of this glory. I'm, I'm just so unbelievably blessed. You just have I no love idea. the story of perseverance. Um, yes. 2020, 2021 has been such a tumultuous year for everybody yes. in some capacity, mm -hmm. in some capacity, even those who didn't lose their job. Maybe they right. lost a loved one. Yes. Um, they, they lost something that they wanted to do. Um, mm -hmm. And hearing your story, you know, getting your bio and knowing you for when you got into the business, we pretty much did it at the same time. And then seeing where you are now and then uh, the honor 
of being the voice for the Tony Awards. So tell me about the first time you got that call. How were you alerted or told? <sighs> so my mentor, my voiceover mentor, her name is Randy Thomas. Okay. She's a woman. Get, just remember <laughs> that. Remember that because us women have this 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 horrible reputation of being catty and not wanting right. to help one another. That's right. Honey, Randy Thomas is my mentor and she is the voice of the Tony Awards and the Grammys and the Oscars and Super Bowl. Like she's a major, major star. And um, she called me. She wasn't able to do it this year. And she called me and she said, they may be looking for someone. That's how she told me. They may be looking for someone to do the Tonys this year. Do it. And she hung up. She didn't give me any information. She didn't, she didn't give me the job. I mean, she doesn't really necessarily have that power, but she left it up to me. Like she always does. She, she's like the wind beneath my wings. And so I did the research. I found out the name of one of the producers and I simply emailed her and I said, Hey, look, I, um, I have a bunch of live voiceover experience and I heard through the grapevine that you may be looking for someone. <laughs> definitely let me know and when i sent it i said there's no way she's gonna call me back <laughs> just because because you know you know what i mean but yeah. i've also learned to adapt this attitude that when you want something you do what you do and then you let it go you don't you don't you know you don't obsess over it because yes. that that's that takes a that sucks a lot of negative energy out of you so i let it go woke up the next morning girl and she was like, do you have anything you can send me? So I sent her a quick demo. I sent it and I let it go. I was like, there's no way she's going to call me back. No way. <laughs> when minutes she called me back, she was like, you're hired. Wait, wait like, a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> From I sent it, let it go just to call. You're hired? Mm -hmm. And that is, that, that is the one thing that I wish people would take away mm. from tonight's conversation. That when you want something, you have to just go for it. How did I get the job? I just asked for it. You know, fear stops a lot of people second guessing yourself and then speaking to people who don't know really what you've been through, what it takes to go. I, I often see people seek counsel in the wrong people when it comes to making some decisions, whether it's finances, whether it's careers. Yes. And it, it's really knowing yourself. And no is, a, no is definitely a part of this business. Oh, Firing sure. is a part of this business. It is. It just is the nature of the business, Repeatedly. right? Repeatedly. Repeatedly. I mean, honestly, I, I may audition. I, I, I may audition six times a day. So if you do the math, that's six times a day, five times a week. That's 30 times a week. I might book four jobs out of those 30. So I get told no all the time. But it's not about being rejected. It's about not being selected at the time. Okay. I believe I like that. that what's for you is for you. And sometimes even man's rejection is God's protection. So mm -hmm. I don't question it. Sometimes some of these, these opportunities that come through, come through in my inbox, girl, it makes me salivate. Like, oh my <laughs> God, would I love this opportunity. But I figure, you know, I do the best I can. And if I don't get it, there's a reason why. Yeah. I don't obsess. I just let it go and I just, it's, there'll be more. You know what I mean? So when she told me that I was hired, I was floored. I was floored because Soul Train is always pre recorded. So that's easy. You know what I'm saying? And you've been doing that for five years. I didn't even yeah. know that, Keisha. Girl, you yeah, ain't know. Okay, yeah, we yeah. have some pictures. No, five years. You know, we got we have to do some more connecting. I'm gonna have my producer pull up some images because you talked about doing so. You guys see this lady right here? She's been doing <laughs> the voice for Soul Train for five years. I, I can't believe it. And Keisha, your voice yes. is so distinctive. So this right, this is Keisha. Okay, so Keisha, tell us about this. So this is actually one of the years where, of course, pre-COVID, where they decided to fly me out. It, the, the show was being recorded in Las Vegas. And that moment was actually my first time ever live announcing live, if that makes sense. So in other mm -hmm. words, the show is being recorded, but I was literally reading the script as the show was being taped. 
And so still the pressure is on because, you know, you're wearing your headphones and, you know, you, if you if you look at that picture, if you could pull that picture up one more time, you see that lady's hand like, oh, on, on yes. the lower right. She's oh, like, she, she's giving me a countdown. She's like, hold on. Wait one second. Three, two, one. And in my headphones, it's a ton of people screaming and yelling. The producers are like they're they're giving cues with regards to the cameras. It's a lot. So it was really rough. But you know, in order to get experience, you got to do it, right? And so that's that right. set the stage for me. But the Tonys is 100% live. So I was scared. Look, I superwoman. was Superwoman, S on your chest. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. In more ways than one. So yeah, it was an experience. But do you know, I did not flinch. I did not mess up one time. I just felt like I belonged. A lot of times you got to get out of your own way. You have to get out of your head and just do it. Just do it. Thank you, Nike. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just when, do when, it. When, I get the, when I get that dream mini mansion, I'm going to have those words plastered <laughs> on, on the driveway. Just do it. You just have to do it. You know what I'm saying? And yes, you'll be afraid. Yes, you might even get nauseated because I have plenty of times, but you just have to do it. You have to be hungry. You have to be determined and you have to know that you know that you know that you belong. And that's the story of my life, Taylor. That's Keisha, the story of my life. You're in the history books. Honestly, what does that feel like? Um, uh, uh, an undenying sense of pride. Like I get to encourage a whole generation of black women, or women, but black women as well, um, you know, behind me, not behind me, but next to me. You know what I mean? Um, you know what you mean? I just, that I want that to be my legacy long after I leave this earth that she tried to inspire and encourage as much as she possibly could. Not only through her words, but through her actions. Little girl from New York, reading um, uh, reading uh, greeting cards <laughs> at ten years old on a one nine hundred number. She yes. was ending up making history. Um, how did your family and your friends back home respond to hearing the news? Well, my mom, she's you know she's eighty and. <laughs> She doesn't think, yeah, I, I think she's proud, but she doesn't really get it. Like, I don't, I don't think, think people really understand the magnitude of, of really what voiceover is and how powerful voiceover is. To me, it was, it was only, not only historic in the sense of me only, you know, me being the first black woman, but you know, we just came out of, not completely, but we just came from like a pandemic. And so the, the theme of this year's show was Broadway's back. And so after folks not being, you know, again, not only being able to enjoy a Broadway show, but you got to remember that Broadway consists of thousands of actors and, and producers and musicians. And like, it has been a rough time emotionally for many, many, many people. And so to come up off of that horrible situation that we were all in, and then to come back into it, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and with me again, being the first black woman, but just coming out of a, a, of a pandemic, I don't even know how to put that into words. I really don't. And, and, and again, a lot of people that I went to school with, they don't, I don't think folks really understand the power of voiceover. Because, you know, we listen to commercials and yeah. we watch movie trailers and, and we, you know, we play video games and voiceover is all around us. But I don't think people really understand the magnitude and how important that is. Audio books, like it, it's so powerful, but they'll get it one of these days, girl. It, it's, it's, you know, it is truly a different world. And I think until you're sitting somewhere and you're having to read a teleprompter or a script as the, you know, producer is talking in your ear and you're having to keep control, it yes. is really, really interesting. And it's truly a challenge. And then to do it live yes. is a whole nother animal, right? A fascinating. whole nother it's animal. Absolutely fascinating. It really so, is. So Keith, what's next for you? Oh, my God. well, I have some really exciting projects coming down the pike. I booked my first video game um, recently. Okay. I can't I can't say much about it, but right? that's really exciting because, you know, again, to do commercials is one thing and live announce is another genre. But animation and, and character work is a whole nother 
uh, uh, you know, area that I never thought I'd do. And I've also, it's another show. We, we don't have much time to, to talk about it, but there's another genre of, of voiceover called ADR. Just Google it, guys. It's it's interesting. But I just, ADR, A is an Apple, D is in David, R. Okay. Um, I just booked um, a voice match for Halle Berry. And Wait. so she's, yeah. I, it's exciting. I, I, wow. I'm telling you, she she's coming out with a movie uh, at the beginning of the year. It's called Moonfall. And when you watch the trailer, you might see a a a, a portion of of the the trailer where she's talking, but you don't see her face. Well, mm -hmm. that'll be my that'll be my voice. Okay, I'm excited. Keisha, how can we follow you? <sighs> I'm everywhere. I'm on every single platform possible. I'm on Facebook, Keisha Monk. I also have a separate voiceover page. So if you want to follow my career, that's Keisha Monk voiceover. I'm on Twitter at Keisha Monk. I'm on um, Instagram. Just Google me. I'm everywhere. Keisha Monk, K-E-S-H-A-M-O-N-K. Oh, look like at Keisha back in the day with <laughs> Jack Jackson. Yeah. My radio career was pretty impressive too. I've worked in, I started off in, in North Carolina. From there, I went to Pittsburgh. I did mornings in New York with Isaac Hayes. Then I went to LA. My show came on right after Steve Harvey. I did uh, GCI in Chicago. I did mornings in Boston, middays at Kiss FM. I tried to take Wendy's job when she left BLS. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've been everywhere. I've been everywhere. I, I, I've had an incredible career. I'm incredibly blessed and humbled. You know. And you actually um, had a syndicated show with Randy Jackson. How long did that go last? It, yeah, it was six years, actually. It, it was wow. like a countdown show. A countdown show, it came on on the weekends. And um, I, I used to record in uh, in New York uh, right after my, my midday show uh, at KISS FM. And that lasted for six whole years. Six years. That's some good stuff yeah, right that, there. Yeah, that's a good run. That's a good run. Yeah. It really is. That is some good stuff right yes, there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just I'm just enthralled. I can't wait to see the movie that um, Halle Berry's putting out. So I know the voice behind it. <laughs> it's your girl, Keisha Monk. No I, K E S H. Don't blink. If you blink, you might miss it's okay. it. But yeah. It looks, it's okay, right? It's okay. Because we take the parts. And I love how you said you started just straightening up an office. And now look where you're at. So yes, I think sometimes we have to realize we can't be bigger than we are. And right. sometimes we have to do the work That's and right. getting in this industry. I, you know, I call radio and television, the, you know, the industry getting into it. You have to be on your run. You really, really do. You do. You do. And, and I hope the millennials are listening because, you know, uh, yeah. my daughter particularly, she don't want to, you know, take, you know, get coffee. You know, you might have to do a coffee run to get in the door. Do what you got to do to get in the door, you know. So. And I think it's I think it's important to Keisha, not only just to mention, um, you know, being willing to do administrative things. Right. Yes. But to keep focus on what it is that you want to do, that you don't get locked into doing that and that right. you don't get caught up in office politics. You stay focused on the job at hand. I want to yes. be on air. I want to be a PD. I want to be a yes. job, whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Staying focused. And I think that's what's really, really important. And stay so focused. many great you know, a lot of great talent has come you know out of raleigh north carolina because you know it's it's real you get can pretty much do so much there it's you a can. great place to, yes. to really get your feet, feet wet and keisha monk um she made history for those of you just tuning in now you missed an incredible interview. Keisha Monk is the voice. She was the live voice. She's the first woman of color to announce the Tony Awards Live. She did it this year, 2021. And we had her here for this one-on-one -on -one conversation here on NNPA and Black Press USA. Keisha, I can't thank you enough. And I'm going to give you the last minute to just share any words of encouragement to your supporters and those watching now. Absolutely. With first, Taylor, what an honor. Again, I'm such a crybaby. You should be really proud of me that I didn't bawl my eyes out. Um, more importantly, I, I just, just uh, what an honor it is to be connected to you once again. I'm so proud of you. I've always been proud of you. And thank you, thank you so much for allowing me to um, spread my message on your show. But um, my final say is whatever you want, manifest it. Speak it into existence. Even if, even if it doesn't make sense, even if you cannot even see the horizon, manifest it. 
see it, then be it. And that's it. I'm a and Keisha, witness. are you cancer free? I am cancer free. I'm cancer free. I love it. I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, we can we can applaud that. Absolutely. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, wonderful Keisha Monk. Keisha, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you and your family. And we'll see each other soon. OK, yes. Yes. When you come to D.C. <laughs> That's a promise. That's a promise. Thanks again, Taylor. You are welcome. Oh, my goodness. I could talk to her for an hour easily. Um, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Um, I am your host, Taylor Thomas, and this is NNPA Black Press USA. Oh, my goodness. I love it. I love it. I love it. Love it. All right. So now we're going to switch gears. My next guest is an author and not just only of children's books for African-American children, but comic books. So we're going to talk now to Brian Taylor. Let's welcome him to the show. Hello, Brian. How's it going? It's wonderful. Oh, just coming off the heels of talking to Keisha. Just so exciting. Yeah, she was awesome. Shout out to her. That was, that was an awesome interview. Yeah, she's really great. Now, you're an interesting person. So you, you have the book that you have, Kendall's World. But you know, it's yes. interesting because looking at your bio, it has nothing to do with kids or books. I mean, you have a serious background. Let's, what is your, by trade, what, do you, what is your background before we get into Kendall's world? Right. Well, I attended South Carolina State University and I got a degree in uh, political science. And so I started my career in politics, which I still love to this day. I spent about six or seven years on Capitol Hill, worked for a governor for a few years. I became a state lobbyist and a federal lobbyist. I uh, worked on, I built my own nonprofit that would focus on political education and civic engagement. Worked on a bunch of national campaigns throughout the years. I was in liberal politics and uh, it, was, it was a great ride. I had a lot of fun doing it. Met some amazing people, learned some great lessons in life. And then I transitioned into finance. I got into finance after that. And so I did that for almost 10 years as well. And so the, uh, the, the, the writing part came along the way throughout those years. I, was, I would write stuff down and doodle on my own and kind of let thoughts manifest in my mind. And after a little while, I began to put pen to paper and really put it together. My first book was a book of poetry, which I actually started writing in my late 20s. And so that's still my, my, I feel like my greatest accomplishment because it's the rawest me ever that I put down on paper. And so I was really proud of myself of accomplishing that. And uh, then I got inspired uh, by my niece, uh, my niece, Kendall. Uh, she okay. is the, the inspiration behind Kendall's world. And I happened to be in her room one day and she's a very artistic, she's 13 now. This is when she was six years old. And she's very artistic, so doesn't draw and create. And she had all this stuff on the walls all over her bedroom. She wasn't even in the room. I just walked in and looked at what she had done. And the walls were covered with their drawings and paintings and all these different things. And I just uttered to myself out loud, wow, Kindle's world. And that was the birth of the, of, the, of the concept and the idea. And it literally snowballed from there. So my producer, we're going to pull up the cover of one of your um, Kindle world. I think you have a true friendship. That's the that's this is the latest one, right? True friendship. That's actually the first one. Yeah, that's the first one. Uh, the latest one is virtual friendship. That's okay, the this workbook. is the workbook. Right. Okay, so so break it down to us. There's the book, and then there's. Can you tell tell us the difference between the two? Obviously, a workbook is something that you have to do. So what's the how do how do you your collection? What's your collection? Right. Well, the first book is True Friendship, and that's the story of, of, of these five, seven year old kids. And they're all best of friends. They all live in the same community. They all go to school together, but they're all different. They are, they're socioeconomically different. They're racially different. And they all have a challenge. And the one thing I wanted to, to get across with, with the concept of Kindle's World is that it's OK to have friends that are different because we're all inherently different. And in this day and age, kids need to know that. OK, so we have Kendall. Uh, she has, she's selfish. She's a selfish little girl, cute as, cute as she can be, but she's selfish. You have Tristan. He has anger management issues. You have Cameron, who's autistic. You have Kiera, who has self-esteem issues. And you have Corey Addison, uh, who has, a, 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 she has two mothers. So she comes from an unconventional family. And so they grow on these imaginary journeys where one of their issues is apparent. And in the first book, True Friendship, they find out that their friend Cameron is autistic. And they don't know what to do about that. And so they have to come together as friends and, and, and love on Cameron and let him know that no matter what, we're still going to be friends. And so it's just keeping kids involved and let them know that, you know, it's OK to be different because, again, we're all inherently different. 
So it, you say nothing inspired you from the political chaos on <laughs> Capitol Hill that you 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 have any of these particular people or or senators or rep representatives what? because that sounded like something I've heard recently um, in the news wire. <laughs> no, no, that that was that, that that was my niece. And when I started the process of creating Kimmel's World, I actually researched content that was already out there. I researched George Explorer. I researched Doc McStuffins. And all the other different characters that exist out there. And my my brother and sister are both educators by trade. And so, and I've spent time in the education world myself. So hearing their stories about what's going on in the classroom from a very, very young age, what these children are actually going through, my my concept, I wanted to create something that was that was actually real, that kids can be entertained by, they can be educated by, but they can also see themselves within the characters. Not everybody lives in a perfect world has perfect conditions but and so when you read this stuff i wanted the kids to actually say okay well you know i come from my conventional family or i have I, i'm angry about some things and teach them how to manage those feelings with their friends coming together as one and so that's that's one of the main things i want to do is make it make it real for the kids to actually connect with and no i didn't get that from politics <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're telling me, but we'll talk about it later. But so, so right. you know, in choosing these types of children, you know, an autistic child, a selfish child, an anger right. child, a child dealing with anger management, I'm kind of surprised to see so many young children that you can classify with anger management. That's kind of interesting um, to see that you pick that out. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 a thing. It, it's it's really a thing, and I think you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, black boys, especially, and some black girls as well, but definitely black boys, they get labeled very young uh, uh, with these anger management problems in, in school, and they they don't they don't get grace. They a lot of times they don't get the grace from the, from the teachers or the administrators about why this child is angry, what's going on in this child's life that's making him uh, act out the way that he's doing. And so again, I wanted to create a tool uh, that that the classrooms can use, that families can use, because a lot of these topics are even hard for families to get into with their kids. You know, uh, and so if, if you're reading a book with your son and your daughter and the content of the book addresses some things that you may think are going on with your, your, your child, it's easy to get into that conversation. Sometimes it's easy for the kid to read this book and want to talk to it with the parent. And so, again, trying to create new content with these tools that can help families as well as schools, as well as students. So what age group are, is this book for Kendall's World? Uh, we, we literally from three to about nine or ten. Yeah, it's kind of okay. it's a bit it's a bit of a broad range, but there's a lot of different things in in all the books that can, that uh, a child from those age group can gravitate to. And so, is it in the school system? Is it at the public library? Where do and can no? Uh, get it? Right now, the, the the all my books are on Amazon. Okay. So you can go to Amazon. Uh, Kindle's World is on Amazon, but it's also on, on Walmart.com. And Wait so you can find the merchandise. On, Did you just me? say Walmart.com? That is huge. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, world, uh, books and merchandise on Walmart. Yes. And I have backpacks, boxes, uh, uh, bracelets, magnets, notebooks. Um, so, yeah, go check it out. Go Walmart.com and just search for Kindle's World. OK, so, Brian, you just slid that in there like today is Thursday. <laughs> How did that happen to be um, distributed by Walmart where someone can walk into Walmart, which is one. I mean, it's a huge retailer, especially now that COVID's hit. I mean, people were going to it before, but it's a place where everybody right. goes to find anything they need. Well, it's, it's on it's on Walmart.com. It's not actually in the stores yet. It's on Walmart.com. Okay. But it was about a two year, a two and a half year journey. Uh, I, I tell people all the time, when you go into a Walmart, everything you see on the store, someone else did. Because uh, okay. all Walmart does is take it out the box and put it on the shelves. Uh, and so being, having going through the process of, of, of learning the details of what you have to put together, it's your packaging, it's your labeling, you know, your UPC codes, you know, your, your, you have to get your products tested to make sure they're not harmful to the public. And all that's a ton of research over a lot of time. And, and it just takes, it takes time and you have to grind it out because there's no book to this stuff, you know? So you really got to figure it out. You got to do your research. You got to ask people. And that's what I did for almost two years. I asked everybody I knew, what do you know about this? What do you know about that? Where can I find this? Where can I find that? And I was talking to uh, a buddy of mine recently 
And I was telling him, if you went to college, you need to ask everybody else you know that went to college who they know. Because you might have majored in accounting, but I guarantee you know somebody that majored in law or that majored in psychology or that majored in whatever else. Uh, so you, if, if you know professionals, ask ask professionals. Just ask them, ask whoever you know. Somebody's gonna know somebody. I have I have started out on many, many journeys on this on this process, whether it be find, trying to find animators, trying to find illustrators, trying to find uh, app technicians for app development. I didn't know anybody in those fields. Now, I didn't know anybody that could draw this type of stuff. And so I just kept asking people. And before you knew it, I, I, I knew a ton of people in this world. And I, I like how you said that, you know, you just kept pushing through it. I mean, to come from a political background, you make a really good amount of money doing something like that. The passion for this book, um, I mean, to be able to do it for two years, was there a period where you said, you know, maybe this isn't meant to be? No, actually, I didn't. I really didn't. I started my company in 2016. And so when I when I when I started the company and got on this journey, I had done tons of research. You know, I had done tons and tons of research. And, and I, I, I once I figured out what I wanted to do, it, it again, it snowballed. It began to it began to grow. Kindle's world began to grow. I created Star. I created you know, uh, M7. Um, I created the workbooks, I created the merchandise, I created the websites. And one thing about when you, you made a comment about uh, the, the amount of money that, that's in politics. Yes, I lobbied and it was great. Uh, I had a lot of, a lot of fun uh, doing that. But what we don't do as a people is, is look at what the masses, not, not stop looking at what the masses are doing and look at what the minority is doing. And we don't we don't do that a lot. You know, I, I, I was I talk about this all the time when I when I speak to different groups. There's a ton of uh, black realtors out there, a ton. You know, they're popping up everywhere everywhere you go. There are not a ton of app developers out there. There are not a ton of black uh, video game developers out there. There are not a ton of, of of black animators out there. There's some, but not a ton. And there's a lot of of, of financial growth. And wealth in those fields, and so I think I think one thing I always want to say I want to be a vehicle for the next generation because the younger folks get it. I talk to young kids all the time, and they're talking about coding and developing all this different stuff. They get it, and so uh, I think it's people in, in in our generation that are still I won't say stuck, but not just not understanding the opportunities that are out there if they uh, take a take a leap of faith and, and see what they can do. Yeah, uh, I, I think more and more communities. Um, are trying to connect children of color and minority children with STEM. They're so, and, and just to right. show them right. there's more than just playing the video game, there's creating it, there's coming up with the concepts, there's programming it. Um, there's so exactly. many different things and and, um, and just getting them to think of not the things that are obvious, there's things behind there that you may be talented to be able to do. Um, so you're exactly right about that. Can you talk to me a little bit about the inspiration <clears throat> behind your comic book series entitled star yes well uh star was actually in, inspired by dr brina lindsay so shout out to brina lindsay uh and the 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 idea of star which 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 i love so much is that star is not like you see comic books today or or like the, the marvel series and whatnot you're either a mutant of some kind or you're you're made <laughs> in, in, a, in a lab you know they they created you in the lab uh, right. Star is not Star is not that she has a, a, a defect, uh, a brain defect uh, that unlocks her mind uh, and, and and gives her gives her the ability of whatever she thinks about hard enough she can actually do, and so that's I love that because I I, I tell uh, when I talk to women and young ladies about Star I said that the the moral of the concept is that you as a woman already have the ability to do whatever you want to do inside you already. So whatever you seek to do in this world, you already have what it takes to accomplish it. And that's why I'm launching uh, Young Star next year. And it's going to be okay. uh, uh, kind of a tween version of Star. She's going, the first book will be out probably next summer. And it's going to be her turning from 12 to 13 and kind of that tween age where they're, they're a, little, <laughs> a little bit awkward trying to figure things out. And she's gonna she's gonna be figuring out who she is and what she can do and her powers, 
And so uh, uh, I love that about the concept. Uh, and I just think more women need to, to, to understand that about themselves, that whatever you want to do. And like you like your first guest, you know, she she's a star. She is star. Yeah, she is. You know, she, she wanted is. to do it and she went out there and did it. She didn't like anything standing her way. And she knew she had whatever it took inside of her to accomplish her goals. That star. So do you have a daughter or is it just your niece that has you so driven and focused on inspiring young girls and women to be the best of themselves? It's it's my niece, but 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 it's also just, you know. Again, I, when I was a kid, I loved I loved comics. I loved again cartoons and superheroes and all that stuff. And they're they're very influential on kids, you know. And and I, I wanted to create imagery that little black and brown kids can look at and and feel that 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 power and that strength that comes from from images. And I always say that you know when you look at the Marvel series, it was a great series of movies. Uh, the movie that grossed the most was Black Panther. Oh my gosh! Out of all the people movies, people are still excited about it. That was amazing. Exactly. That but was, it was amazing. Because people, people who don't usually watch uh, uh, comic book movies wanted to see Black Panther because it was a black superhero. And, and so, so well I, put together, it just really absolutely, was incorporating absolutely. powerful, strong women as well as the men. I, I, yes. Wakanda will live forever. <laughs> okay, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so that that that's got to be you know, um, we did an NPA um, two years ago. Um, took part in in being um, a, a, a Afro Comic Con, and so okay. you know the comic book world or industry that's a whole nother game. Those are loyal, yeah. loyal fans. Absolutely. So you're doing something totally different. You do the kids book, you know, Kindle's world, and then you have yes. star. And then we're going to talk about M seven in a second, but you know, transitioning into that world. And, and once you, once you get into it and you're accepted, you have loyal followers. What are you hearing Absolutely. from people about star? Everybody's loving it. And well, women who bought star and women who were buying the t-shirts and, and loving star, all they kept saying is, do you have anything for my daughter? Oh, you have anything wow. like that for my daughter? They 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 were loving it, and their daughters were loving it. But you know, they they wanted it to be more age appropriate for their for their daughter, and that's why I had to create Young Star because the idea is not to leave anybody out. You know, I I I, I wanted to have Young Star for the young ladies out there. I want to have Star for for the women out there. You know, uh, Kindle's World for for that for that 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 younger crowd, and then I want M Seven for the guys. You know, uh, uh, and so I don't want to leave anybody out. Everybody deserves to have a hero. Everybody deserves to have somebody to look up to. And I want to provide that for them. Okay, so I'm going to have a producer pull up M7. So tell us, what does M7 stand for? It stands for the Magnificent Seven. Okay. Okay, that is <laughs> awesome. So, okay, so I'm looking at a book now, The Power of the Diamond. So right. is this, this is the seven here? That is the seven, correct. And, and what are their powers? The, well, they all have different powers. And I'll, I'll give you some, some background. The, the, the seven is 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 uh, me and, and six of my friends from college. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so, Okay, so which I, one I, are you? I'm going to go ahead and ask, Brian, which one are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you look at it and figure it out, okay? <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm going to have to get close to this. Okay, and see. So tell me their characteristics. Maybe that's what that, that'll be better. Okay, so, or their power, excuse me. Okay, well, one of them, uh, my, my man Sam, you know, he 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 has the power of man, uh, manipulating fire. Uh, Eric is moves at the speed of light. Uh, Dia has uh, healing power. Uh, Kevin can move the earth and water. Uh, my character is telepathic. Uh, Raymond is, is indestructible, and uh, and Damien uh, has power shooting out of his chest. So when you told your friends you have this M7 and you tell them, listen, this is based on my friendship with you. <laughs> what was the response? <laughs> uh, they, they got a good laugh out of it for sure. Uh, but they, they, they were digging it though. They're still digging it. So what do you hope men pull from this? Comic book lovers. You know, my, my, my goal for M7 and, and for guys is to see that, you know, we're, we're in this together. You know, uh, uh, black men can can be rivals at times when it's not necessary. Uh, black men can have poor communication with each other 
and and we and that, that poor communication uh, brings rifts a lot of times in, in, in the black male community. And so I, I want to show that we we can the power that we have when we come together. And there, there, there's a line uh, in in the book where it, where it says um, they they are they are powerful uh, individually, but they're invincible together. And so and that, and that's that's what I want that's what I want the brothers to understand that if we come together and communicate properly with each other, understand each other, we 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 we're, we're the most powerful thing on earth when we come together. How long did it take you to put something together? Because I would think for the Kendall's world and for Star and then M7, you have to be in a different space mentally. I mean, really in a different place to write that. How does it, how long does it normally take you to do the, the individual books? It depends. Um, I usually go on writing binges. Like during the pandemic, I wrote like 10 books. <clears throat> uh, no, actually, I wrote about fifteen. I wrote, I wrote, uh, I wrote like six books for Kindle. I wrote like four books for um, for Star. I wrote two for M Seven, and I wrote two for my new concepts that are coming out next year. Okay. Yeah, and so it, it, it's really just a process of, of. I always have ideas, and I'll just jot ideas down on paper as, as I get them or put it in my phone. And then I'll go back to them and I'll spend a couple of weeks processing it and amplifying the thought. And when I sit down to write, uh, it takes me about 15 minutes to kind of get it, get in into the story, mm-hmm. you know, where my mind is in the story. I, I, I'm in the story of Star. I'm in the story of M7. Uh, I'm in Kindle's world. And once I get my head into the space, it, it just it just flows after that. So this is what you're doing. This is this is, you know, your daily um, venture that you do each day is working on, you know, honing on or creating something else new. Well, that and creating new opportunities. Again, um, our Walmart is, is moving along. Uh, and so we're still we're still pushing that forward. I am in the beginning stages of creating my app uh, for Kindle. That will come. That'll be out next year. It'll be called Ask Kindle. It's a game. Okay, app. So a game app. So what can we expect from that? A uh, good time for kids. Uh, you, something that can, you can put in front of your kids, and they can play with it. They can learn from it. Uh, they can they can ask ask Kindle questions when they get stumped on the questions that they have. It'll be it'll be uh, different levels that they can win prizes off of. The biggest uh, uh, thing about the Ask Kindle app, if you get so many points at the end of the game, you'll get a, a discount uh, to go to Walmart.com and get a discount on Kindle's World items. I like it. I like it. So yeah. you obviously you're, you're in the process of doing that. So as we prepare for 2022, what can we expect to come from the B Taylor? Wow. Or next year's going to be a big year. <laughs> next year's okay. going to be a big year. Uh, the M7 part two book will be out first of the year next year, probably around February. Okay. Um, we're going to have, uh, I'm doing a collaboration book with star on young star. And that'll be out. Uh, it's called the Legacy of Star, and that'll be out probably next July. Uh, and I'm putting out a new concept called The Great Adventures of Little B, which is a story of three one-year-olds. Uh, <laughs> Wait and, and, a minute! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! I, I'm right now. I'm visualizing. I'm um, actually seeing something on TV. But go ahead. I can just see that as a TV yeah, yeah. Show. It's, oh, it's, a, it's a story of of three one-year-olds, and they meet in the daycare center. So imagine. <laughs> When you were one years old and your mom drops off at daycare and you, you meet these two people and and one's a little girl one's a little boy and it's two boys and a girl and uh uh it, it's uh it's little b and he's a little black boy and there's tj he's a latino boy and there's sage and she's a little white girl and you know i, I don't know about you but when i when i in my community that i grew up in i don't know when i saw a white person everybody in my house was black Everybody in my community was black. So I have no idea when I saw my first white person that wasn't on TV. That is funny. That is funny. And I so, grew up in an all-white community. So it was the, <laughs> ironically the opposite. But no, no, no. I right. do get it. Yeah, I do get and it. So, and so the whole concept is based on these three, three one-year-olds meeting <laughs> each other, learning about each other, learning about the different cultures and their backgrounds, and recognizing the differences. But as the story develops, seeing that, they're more, that they have more in common than they have oh. different. And they're discovering, they're discovering the world together. Brian, I have 
have to commend you um, from a person who is a military person growing up in England and the Philippines. My mom's English and my father's American. Okay. Um, that's one of the things when I've had the honor to go to schools here in Prince George's County or in the district that I'm able to talk about and dispel so many myths. Um, it, it really does require people to be open to learn about people. I don't I, I encourage people, please don't watch TV to learn about a culture. It, it's right. not the best way. Right. It, it just really isn't. Um, and I, it, it's so great hearing every time you talk about a, pro, a, a project of yours, whether it's um, Kindle's World or whether it's M7 or Star, it's inclusive of all people um, in the variations of us, which I think is just so wonderful. And we need more of that. We really, really do. I'm sure the response has been great. Yeah, I'm, I'm very I'm very pleased with everything. I, it makes me want to do more and create more. And and so, uh, you know, like I said, next this was a good year. Next year is going to be a better year and we're just going to keep moving forward. So it seems like, Brian, perhaps Kendall, um, Kendall, it seems like uh, COVID-19 was a big inspiration kickoff of let me do what I've been wanting to do, but even at more force. Well, you know, uh, COVID was a blessing in disguise uh, for me. Um, I, I just recall when I, I worked on Capitol Hill during 9-11. And, and obviously that was a very tumultuous time for, for the country and for the world. And when the dust settled, and figuratively that is, and I, I was talking to an older gentleman that worked on Capitol Hill, been there for years. And he said to me something I never forgot. He said, whenever there's calamity in America, there's, there's, there's gonna be winners and losers when, it, when it's all said and done. And you have to decide which one you're gonna be. And so when this happened, when COVID hit and everything shut down, well, that, that's calamity. And so I thought about everything that I had going on, everything I wanted to do. And people always say, if I had time, I would do this. If I had time, I would do that. Well, I said, okay, well, now you got time. Uh, and I literally spent uh, weeks on end uh, in my house writing and writing and researching and writing and researching and writing and researching and writing. Because I just told myself, when this this is going to end at some point in time, okay, right. this is going to end. It's going to subside. We're going to get on with our lives, and I'm going to be prepared for whatever I want to do afterwards. And so that's what I focused on doing. So Brian, how can we either get a copy of Star, get a copy of Kendall's World, get a copy of M7, or better yet, just follow you? Let us know how we can stay in touch with you. And Again, support all you. the. Uh, thank you. All the books are on Amazon. You can get them on Amazon. Uh, my website. As btaylorproductions.com. You can get the books there as well. Uh, you can follow me on, on Facebook at uh, B. Taylor Productions. You can follow Kindle's World uh, on Facebook. You can follow Kindle's World on Instagram. Uh, the Real Mag 7, The Real Magnificent 7 is on Instagram as well. Uh, B. Taylor Productions on Instagram as well. And so I'm everywhere. Just look me up. Well, Brian, I expect and, and to also, see And also, uh, real quick, again, Walmart.com, go check us out, search Kindle's World. All the books are there, the merchandise is there. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's, it's Christmas time, season is near, and uh, go check us out on, on Walmart.com. Brian, I expect to see some type of television pilot about M7. <laughs> I just think that would be just so cool with, the, with you know, black men just being able to have those powers. Um, I really, really love the concept of all your books, actually. And I just have to thank you for taking part in this program. You know, I'm a big proponent for children and connecting children to resources. I've been doing it for a number of years with my nonprofit. So it makes me excited when I see someone else who has a vision about just connecting the dots and, and, and having us all live in this world and see our right. differences as strength. No, I, I appreciate it. I, I, I used to live in DC area for almost 20 years and so I've seen you throughout throughout my career do your thing. And so when you reached Thank out for me to do this, I, I was I was honored. And so I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. Uh, and, and one thing I just want to say to anybody that's that's listening out there is you have to believe in yourself. You know, there's going to be ups and downs, it's going to be pitfalls, it's going to be bumps in the road, but you can't give up on yourself. You got to believe in yourself more than anybody else in the world. I always say the only person that should believe in you more than you is Jesus Christ himself. Not your mama, not your daddy, not your brother, your sister. You got to believe in you more than anybody else in the world. Don't ever give up on yourself. 
Well, I tell you what, Brian, I want you to come back once that app is ready. I'd love Absolutely. to be able to expose our viewers to um, that software. I'd love to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so very much. Brian Taylor joined us. Before that, we had The Voice, Keisha Monk. And guess what? Next week, you are going to be so excited. We have a, um, a local wine owner, female, black female wine opener, uh, owner, and we have another young lady who created a vodka. You have got to get it. I'm not a drinker, but you've got to hear their stories and you've got to hear how you can support them. So this is it for tonight's show. I want to thank everyone for sticking and staying and listen. If you'd like to be a guest or you have a special story or something that you want to share, let me know. Taylor Thomas anchor at Gmail. That's Taylor Thomas anchor at Gmail. That will do it for tonight. Everyone. Happy holidays. God bless and goodbye. <laughs>